Steve Clemens. I run the foreign policy programs here at the New America Foundation. I want to welcome all of you for joining us uh, for sort of a re-release of a book that has uh, uh, been out this past year. Uh, there are a number of books that New America Foundation has helped uh, launch. Um, many of the covers of them are on the wall. And the American way of strategy is, in my mind, one of the uh, uh, most important manifestos, if we have one, for what the American Strategy Project uh, at the New, Amer New American Strategy Program, I should say, at the New, at the New America Foundation is about. And I'm going to let Mike Lind elucidate that. I am, uh, want to say hello to the viewers online. Uh, again, I'm Steve Clemens. I run the foreign policy programs at the New America Foundation. And Mike Lind has been my colleague uh, at New America for about nine and a half years. I think that's how long it's been. It's sort of, you know, pinch yourself when you say that. I, uh, it's shocking that I would, you know, be anywhere for nine and a half years. Um, we, and we were friends and colleagues, uh, intellectual, uh, uh, intellectually tied together and, uh, and occasional sparring partners uh, from a distance in ways, in, in very different ways. Mike, uh, in his uh, previous days, was former executive editor of The National Interest, a magazine in which I had huge uh, interests myself when I moved to Washington. We actually first talk, uh, talked, I'll never forget, uh, when I spoke to Mike. I was then working for the Nixon Library, trying to set up the Nixon Center at the time, and Chalmers Johnson introduced us from afar uh, because of an article that Mike Lind had written on Alexander Hamilton. Uh, at the time, someone I, in whom I have a great interest. Uh, Mike is um, author of Made in Texas, George W. Bush and the Southern Takeover Amer of American Politics. Um, he was an editor and staff writer for The New Yorker, Harper's Monthly, The New Republic. Um, one fun anecdote I like to tell about Mike is he wrote a great article on one occasion. And I always think when your Congress is in the news and you've got all this ethics stuff out there, uh, Mike one, wrote one of the great articles of all time uh, called How to Make a Senator Smile. Uh, and it came out right during the Senate ethics discussions. I see Alan Gerson here, and he knows this time because I was in the Senate. And I, I can admit now that I was the sort of deep throat source on that article uh, after ethics reform, showing all the ways in which you could still influence a senator and the senator's staff person. Uh, it, was a, it was a great piece. Um, Mike uh, was author as well of the manifesto of this whole institution uh, with Te Ted Halstead uh, of a book called The Radical Center, The Future of American Politics. And of course, he's Whitehead Senior Fellow at New America Foundation. He's involved with so much of the core DNA efforts at the New America Foundation that it's hard to go through all of them. But what I love about Mike is he often, he runs about three or four years ahead of conventional wisdom, which means he's often beaten up until everyone realizes he was right all along. And I, I always feel that Mike is a, is a harbinger of things, but he also digs into history. In my view, he's one of the best uh, uh, political geographers in the country who can look at the sort of roots of contemporary political behavior and look at the uh, geographic and historical roots of social movements and of ethnic movements in the United States. But, but what struck me and it influenced the conference I did in September of 2005, which helped put New America Foundation on the map in foreign policy, it was a conference called Terrorism, Security, and America's Purpose. And that America's Purpose item came from Mike's book. I had read the draft and I had forgotten that uh, NSC 68, which was a, uh, a national security directive dra uh, uh, drafted by Paul Nitza, then head of policy planning in the State Department, started with a, with a statement uh, uh, on the fundamental purpose of the United States. And, he's, and, 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 and uh, Mike wrote, it is hard to imagine a British or French strategic memorandum beginning with the fundamental purpose of Britain or the fundamental purpose of France. And according to NS68, the fundamental purpose of the United States is laid down in the preamble to the Constitution to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, and so on. But what was very important about this when it was written and, and, and the way in which Mike framed it is it brought us back to core important principles of what the DNA of the United States is supposed to be about, what our sort of federal system is supposed to promote and protect, and, and to link it back. And I say this in the light that Mike Lind is also one of the uh, 21st century leading realist, realist thinkers uh, on, on foreign policy. So to, 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 to connect principle and purpose and to think about objectives and how we get there is very much a sort of Lindian exercise. And I'm going to invite him up here now to share his thoughts with us, uh, and we'll enjoy a discussion afterward. Please help welcome Thank Michael you, Lind. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm going to begin by telling you uh, what this book is not. Uh, it's not a uh, boring chronicle of American foreign policy history of the kind that many of you may know all too well, where uh, we secede from Britain, and then the British burn down Washington, and Dolly Madison flees from the White House, and the main blows up and we go to war with Spain. 
uh, and, and to quote uh, Henry Ford, it's uh, one damn thing after another. Uh, that's not what this book is. This book is also not contemporary partisan propaganda dressed up as history. Uh, and that's another genre that is floating around out there, uh, where you have contemporary liberal Democrats or neoconservative Republicans, uh, so-called, or uh, realists for that matter, uh, who go back and cherry pick through history to find examples or statements that will support their particular current position. So if you're an isolationist, then you quote John Quincy Adams, we go not abroad in search of monsters to destroy, or you quote George Washington about avoiding entangling alliances in the farewell address, uh, and ignore uh, other things. Uh, if you're uh, neoconservative, uh, then you go back, everything that uh, Harry Truman said about spreading democracy, you take that out of its context without the uh, other qualifications uh, and make it sound as though the country's always been in favor of militant democracy promotion. Uh, uh, you know, this is about something that I think is out there and has existed throughout American history that I and uh, to some extent other scholars have discovered, a tradition of American foreign policy uh, that has been uh, forgotten, uh, particularly since the 1960s and the 1970s. It was alive and well as late as the Eisenhower administration going all the way back to the Washington administration. It's a matter of themes, a matter of emphasis, uh, and we have forgotten this now. And so I'm trying to uh, recover this tradition, which was not the one that I started with. I've actually changed my views in the course of uh, researching this uh, buried American tradition. And there's some other scholars out there I should mention. Uh, Daniel Dudney, an eminent uh, theorist of international relations, calls this tradition Republican security theory uh, and has a very good book, Bounding Power, uh, that I recommend to everyone that examines it in a uh, much more uh, academic, uh, theoretical way. Uh, so there are a number of us sort of uncovering this buried statue and, you know, here's an arm there and a head there. Uh, and when, when you finally uh, brush the, the dirt away from the statue, it's different from what we expected. Uh, and it does not resemble anything in the particular uh, contemporary spectrum of foreign policy thought that includes uh, uh, liberal interventionists, uh, neoconservatives, so-called realists, uh, libertarians. It actually is different. Well, what, it, what is the core of this uh, tradition? It answers the question of the relationship between domestic liberty and foreign policy. And I don't know about you, but uh, even when I was a kid, I sort of wondered about this, right? Because, you know, our teachers and our uh, statesmen would say, uh, our soldiers abroad, you know, have fought to preserve our liberty at home. Uh, in being a skeptical teenager, uh, I thought, well, wait a minute. You know, uh, was the Kaiser really going to sail up the Mississippi River, uh, you know, and, and occupy and enslave the United States? Uh, did Hitler ever have the power to actually take away our liberty at home? Did the Soviets ever have the capability of doing that? And so for many years, I dismissed this as just rhetoric. Uh, and uh, uh, people who defended this in my lifetime, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, tended to interpret this theme in terms of the liberty of others, democratic peace theory or liberal peace theory. That is, we will never be safe until every single country in the world is a liberal democracy, like those of uh, North America and Western Europe. Well, again, if you're a skeptical teenager, this seems kind of preposterous. After all, through most of American history, uh, everything south of the border was a dictatorship of some sort or another. The world was ruled by royalist, autocratic, aristocratic empires. And yet, up until the 20th century, uh, the U.S. was not in, in any great geopolitical danger, so to say that in a world of dictatorships, we can't be safe. Uh, history doesn't seem to support that either. So is this just rhetoric? I thought it was until I began uh, thinking about some very odd statements that were made by a number of 20th century American statesmen, and these usually are not quoted because they don't make a, they don't fit into the liberal or the conservative or the realist or the neo-isolationist worldview. Uh, uh, let me begin with one from Woodrow Wilson uh, in 1919. He was crossing the country campaigning for U.S. participation in the League of Nations. Uh, here's his argument. Uh, if the United States failed to be belong to the League of Nations, uh, which ensured great power at peace, then the alternative would be perpetual American armament for war. There would be a cycle of world wars every 20 or 30 years, and the U.S. would have to be prepared for it. Wilson said, 
we must be physically prepared, ready for anything to come. We must have a great standing army. We must see to it that every man in America is trained to arms. You've got to think of the President of the United States not as the chief counselor of the nation, elected for a little while, but as the man meant constantly and every day to be the commander in chief of the army and the navy, and you know what the effect of a military government is upon social questions. You know how impossible it is to affect social reform if everybody must be under orders from the government. You know how impossible it is, in short, to have a free nation if it is a military nation and under military orders. Well, you expect to hear this from libertarians. This is Woodrow Wilson. He has just presided over the mobilization of the U.S. economy and the regimentation of society during World War I. Uh, he has been commander-in-chief. He has thrown political opponents and protesters, uh, including Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate for president, into prison. Mm -hmm. And now he's saying, I don't want any president ever to have that power again. But the U.S. is incapable of unilaterally forswearing that power if there are dangers beyond our borders that will force us to do it. So unless we fix the world, we're going to have to have presidents uh, and participate who, who have these, these kinds of vast uh, autocratic powers. And it won't be because they are uh, tyrants who have tricked the public uh, into regimenting the United States. It will be because the public realizes the danger is real. There's a real danger out there, and the American people reluctantly but rationally will choose regimentation over insecurity. It will be a rational choice in that uh, uh, point of history to give up our liberty for security. So he says, unless you fix the world abroad, you can't just defend uh, liberty at home. Uh, and this is the other important point. The liberty that, we are, that our foreign policy is, is uh, defending it is not defending from foreign governments. The threat to, the, these uh, foreign governments may threaten the United States, they may threaten its vital interests, they may threaten national security. They do not directly threaten liberty at home. It is our own government that threatens liberty. It is the, and it is a necessary threat, as I say. It's not the, the Caesarist analysis where some sinister president with a wag the dog phony war, you know, grabs all power. It's where actually it makes perfect sense for us to say, okay, we're going to have universal military conscription because the conditions outside our border are so bad that there will be a bipartisan, near universal consensus that this is what we have to do. So it's our own government, the necessity for us to voluntarily give our government these vast powers at the expense of our liberty that we are, for which our soldiers are fighting. Well, was this just uh, uh, unique to Woodrow Wilson? No. You go to the, uh, in, in my book, I, I have many quotes. I'm not going to go through all the quotes now. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the interventionists make the uh, argument uh, uh, in the late 1930s about U.S. Uh, aid to Britain and then later participation in the war. Uh, Harry Truman, the Truman administration, as uh, Steve mentioned, NSC 66. NSC 66 is often thought of as creating the national security state uh, because it, it was the 68. blue, uh, NSC uh, 68, uh, uh, it created uh, the mobilization of the U.S. economy and the real buildup uh, was really as part of the Korean War. Uh, uh, NSC 68 had come out earlier, but the Korean War really created this uh, large-scale uh, Cold War military that had not existed between 1945 and 1948. The, the section that is very seldom quoted of NSC 68 goes directly to my theme. Well, why do we have to have this temporary buildup? They hoped it would be temporary uh, in response to the Soviet Union. Uh, this is what uh, the authors wrote, uh, Paul Nitsa and the, the other authors. As the Soviet Union mobilized the military resources of Eurasia, increased its relative military capabilities, and heightened its threat to our security, some would be tempted to accept peace on its terms, that is appeasement, but, but here's the, the critical uh, uh, phrase. While many would seek to defend the United States by creating a regimented system, which would permit the assignment of a tremendous part of our resources to defense. Under such a state of affairs, our national morale would be corrupted and the integrity and vitality of our system subverted. In other words, the threat was not that the Soviets would invade the United States and occupy us and brainwash the people in small towns like some of those 1950s propaganda movies you may have seen. That was never the serious threat. The threat was that if they became too powerful and we had too few allies, we would have to fall back entirely on our own resources merely to preserve our uh, standing and, and uh, weight in the world uh, and have Woodrow Wilson's nightmare, universal permanent draft, much more extensive than the, the temporary selective security system we had uh, after, uh, uh, during the early part of the Cold War. 
Um, the, the mobilization of, uh, a, a, quote, a tremendous part of our resources to defense, much greater than the 6 percent of our GDP that we spent in the Cold War, uh, or the roughly 4 percent that we're spending now. So uh, the hawks of uh, uh, Nitza and his uh, fellow authors of NSC 68 are often blamed by the uh, left uh, as uh, being conspiratorial types, you know, who exaggerated Soviet power in order to uh, uh, that the federal government could assume vast amounts of uh, resources from the economy. In fact, they argued, and you can decide whether you thought they were sincere or not, I think they were quite sincere, that if we don't mobilize temporarily now until the Cold War crisis is over, we'll have to mobilize permanently later. And that was the argument about U.S. intervention in World War I and World War II, just very briefly. Uh, the argument was that if uh, Imperial Germany or Nazi Germany managed to conquer Europe, mobilize the resources of the Middle East and of uh, uh, Western Eurasia, Berlin would be the dominant, would be the capital of the world. It would be the dominant superpower. Uh, would it leave us alone in this hemisphere? It probably would. I mean, it wouldn't try to cross the Atlantic Ocean and invade. Uh, but simply because of their sheer power, we would have a choice between appeasing uh, the German uh, uh, hegemons of the, the planet or uh, building up a fortress America. Uh, which was much more militarized than anything we saw uh, in, in uh, the Cold War. We did see that in World War II, but again, it was temporary. The idea was you avert a permanent militarization of the United States by nipping the problem in the bud by crushing it, by preventing the Germans twice uh, from creating this vast empire with resources uh, that would uh, dwarf our own. Uh, the final quote before I, I turn to uh, the next topic comes from uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower. In his uh, first formal address to the American people following his inauguration, uh, entitled it The Chance for Peace, uh, President Eisenhower put the blame on the Soviet Union. He said the amassing of Soviet power was forcing the other nations, quote, to spend unprecedented money and energy for armaments. And he, he thought that was a terrible thing. Uh, this is the worst thing that could happen in the United States, to have to spend all this money uh, opposing the Soviet Union. Uh, and he, again, he's quoted out of context often because this is the context is an attack on the Soviet Union. It's not a claim that there's a sinister military industrial complex that's, in, that's uh, creating a fictitious Soviet threat. He's saying the Soviet threat is real and is forcing us to divert resources to the military industrial complex. And that's bad from his point of view uh, as an American but also as a soldier. He says, every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket signified in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This, I repeat, uh, this is, I repeat, the best way of life to be found on the road the world has been taking. This is not a way of life at all, in any true sense. And he returned to this theme of the danger of necessary militarization of the United States and his farewell address to the American people on January 17, 1961. This conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience than some things that uh, the libertarians and isolationists uh, leave out. He says, we recognize the imperative need for this development. Yet, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. So that is the theme. And I trace this theme not only during uh, the two world wars and the Cold War, uh, but back into the 19th century. If you go back to the Federalist Papers, which among other things is about international relations, because the whole debate within the Federalist Papers, defending the federal constitution, the question is, is the United States going to be a federal nation state or a league of sovereign states, or possibly uh, a system of warring states? And Alexander Hamilton makes a geopolitical argument for federal union in, in the uh, Federalist Papers. He says, you know, uh, if the Union dissolves, there probably won't be uh, 13 separate states. There'll probably be three confederations, a southern one, a mid-Atlantic, and a northeastern. Uh, but the danger is that they would uh, have rivalries with each other. And even if they don't have rivalries with each other, each one would have to have its own military. And then he makes the argument from economies of scale, from the point of view of the liberty of American citizens, from the South all the way to New England, it's better to have a single federal government with military economies of scale. That means lower taxes, uh, uh, less uh, uh, intrusion in the economy. It's cheaper uh, than it is to have three or four or five 
regional uh, alliances, each with its own standing military. And George Washington, in his farewell address, uh, drafted by Alexander Hamilton, uh, repeated this. So uh, there, there's a lot more on this theme in uh, uh, the book, but the basic point is we want to tailor our foreign policy to our constitution. Uh, that is, we don't want to tailor our constitution to our foreign policy. Uh, and uh, our foreign policy has to be focused on creating conditions outside of our borders. If you're a small country, you have no say. You know, I mean, the, the, the Serbs and the, uh, the Peruvians can come up with plans for world order, but, you know, but they're not going to make much of a difference. But by the 20th century, anyway, the United States is one of the players, not the only one. So then the question is, well, what kind of world order do we want? And the conventional continental European realist answer, we want one that maximizes our interests, it's an answer, but it's not the traditional American answer. There is a unique kind of American realism, if you want to call it that, which says uh, we're not about maximizing our military power and wealth at all costs. We're a, we want power, we want wealth, we want trade, we want resources, uh, but we want to do so in a way that preserves our federal, democratic, republican, civilian constitution, uh, that preserves the nature of our society. We don't want to be Prussia. Right? We could be more powerful if we were Prussia, you know, or some autocratic state, but we don't want that. Uh, so we, our strategy needs to be one that creates a world, uh, help working with others uh, beyond our borders, where the need for the Prussianization of American society, if you want to call it that, is averted. And it is this that Woodrow Wilson was referring to when he said we must make the world safe for democracy. Wilson did, never said we must make the entire world democratic. He said we must make the world safe for democracy. Safe from what? From the need for democracies to turn themselves into autocratic militarized states because there's a world war every 20 years. That's why the Wilson administration and then the Roosevelt administration and the United States, the League of Nations, the United Nations system were devoted to averting world wars, not to promoting democracy. You can be in favor of promoting democracy in every country and, and human rights. That's not what the system was designed to do. The theory was if you create a system where you don't have this danger of a world war every 20 or 30 years, uh, then the security costs for whatever democratic republics are out there, and they may be a minority of the countries in the world, they may be a majority, those security costs are sufficiently low, uh, then you, you, they don't have to become militarized regimes. Now, you can have a militarized democracy, too, you know, where you know, basically everyone at 18 is drafted, uh, where the prime minister or the president uh, is the commander in chief 24 hours a day, uh, uh, and, and, it's, and where the public voluntarily supports this because of the danger that they perceive. Uh, so you can have democracy without liberalism. So ultimately, this is not just about democracy, it's about how can you create a world that is so safe that countries, if they want to, they don't have to, but if they want to become democratic republics, if they want to shrink their government to less than half of GDP, if they want to have small professional armies, if they want the civilian economy to predominate, if they want to have a very elaborate systems of civil rights, how can they afford that without endangering their security? Uh, and uh, the answer that Americans in this tradition came up with uh, was to choose two of basically four patterns of world organization. And, and uh, I have to be somewhat theoretical here, but that's the, the nature of, of the discussion. Mike, if you're going to speak, you yeah. I hope everybody uh, can, can see this. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but uh, if you can also read these for the Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the four ways that a system of multiple states can be organized, uh, sort of commonsensically, uh, hegemony, balance of power, concert of power, 
or spheres of influence. And these are fairly simple uh, concepts, so, so don't be put off by them. Uh, hegemony is a, a big word that simply means a domination or, or primacy. It comes from the Greek word hegemon, which meant a general uh, or leader of an alliance. Uh, hegemony is not empire. There, these two terms are used interchangeably to a certain extent, but it's misleading. Empire means you eradicate the sovereignty of all of the other states and you form a world government. I'm not considering, because no American uh, statesman ever considered uh, two other possibilities. One is world government in the form of a, a coercive world empire or a voluntary world federation. This just has not been seen as a, 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 a possibility. Uh, the other is pure anarchy where you don't have any functioning states. And again, uh, so these four systems, if you have multiple independent states, how are they related to one, each other, to, to one another? Uh, hegemony means that you have one state that is so powerful in this system of multiple states that while it doesn't rule them directly in the sense that an empire does, it does not reduce them to colonies or provinces, uh, essentially it monopolizes uh, a coercive force within the system. Uh, and uh, the, all the others are reduced to second tier uh, dependencies of, of this uh, giant power. Or if they're independent, at least they don't challenge it directly. Uh, uh, they try not or they'll be swatted down. Balance of power comes in two versions. And again, I apologize for being theoretical, but that's what the, the debate is about. You have to uh, deal with these concepts. Uh, there's a balance of power among equals where you have three or four or five uh, great powers. And, and we're talking about great powers, too, because the majority of sovereign states in the present day system are extremely weak, and, and they're not part of the great power system. So we're talking about uh, the, the actual military economic great powers. Uh, in a traditional balance of power, there are shifting alliances among two or more powers and there's no outside actor. Uh, in, in what's called an offshore balancer system, uh, you have some entity that is outside of the balance of power that, so, that holds the balance, to use the old term. For example, Britain was said to hold the balance of power in Europe. You know, uh, some people today make the case that the United States should hold the balance of power in Eurasia. That means you have an unbalanced power outside of the regional system of great powers, uh, and it can intervene to tip the balance to one side or another. Uh, so uh, hegemony, balance of power, concert of power. The term concert comes from the concert of Europe. Uh, the idea is, again, it's not an egalitarian system. It's very hierarchical where the great powers pretty much monopolize uh, military force. But they get along with each other. They collaborate, not because they like each other, but because they want to avoid balance of power. They, they want to avoid conflict. You know, the old saying is uh, uh, keep your uh, friends close and your enemies closer. And so that's the logic of a concert of power system, which I'll get back to. It's often uh, viewed as a kind of naive, you know, idealistic Wilsonian, we'll all be friends sort of thing. On the contrary, it's more like the mafia. You know, the mafia families cut a deal amongst themselves to avoid mafia war. Uh, finally, there's spheres of influence, uh, which in the context of the United States was the basis of the isolation uh, policy. Uh, but on a global scale, if the United States has its own Monroe Doctrine, you know, then other countries say, well, why can't you have you know, our Monroe Doctrines in Asia and Europe as well? Uh, I'll, I'll just conclude, because I want this to be a discussion, not just a lecture, uh, by going down the list and, and giving you the argument why Americans preferred two of these strategies to others for reasons that had nothing to do with abstract theoretical power political uh, considerations and had everything to do with the effect of world order on America's internal, domestic, constitutional, and economic relationships. First, hegemony. Uh, well, we, we've already dealt with uh, one of the arguments uh, uh, why the United States does not want a world order characterized by a hostile hegemon. Uh, you don't want imperial Germany dominating the world, and you didn't want the Soviet Union dominating Eurasia either, uh, because then it would give us a choice between appeasing them, between being a tributary state, uh, which is the term I use in the American way of strategy, or becoming a fortress America. And this was the debate, as you may recall, in the late 1930s. Uh, Charles Lindbergh and others said, well, we'll stay out of the World War, uh, let the Germans and Russians fight each other. Uh, but as it became clear that Germany might win, even if you look at Lindbergh, uh, uh, who was an isolationist, but his requirements for American security kept getting higher and higher and higher in 39, 40, and 41. So, well, you know, of course, we'll have to have a draft. We'll have to ramp up bomber, transatlantic bomber production. Uh, so by the end, Lindbergh's requirements, uh, he, he, he suggested we might have to take over Caribbean islands and, and Canada. Uh, 
Uh, so he, he was realistic in the sense that isolationism by 1940-41 would have meant essentially a militarized American empire in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so there was no choice between having small government or intervention abroad. It was a, a militarized government at home permanently, the Lindbergh option, or it was temporary militarization until the emergency is over and then you demobilize, which was the Roosevelt option. Uh, now, uh, having said that, spheres of influence made perfect sense uh, in the 19th century in the American context. Uh, uh, one of the things that you're not taught in uh, the usual chronicles of American foreign policy history where one thing happens after another is that there were strategic reasons uh, behind the War of 1812, uh, behind the Mexican War, and behind the Spanish-American War. Uh, one of the reasons the United States uh, seized California uh, was to make sure that uh, the ports of, of uh, San Diego and San Francisco, if California became independent from Mexico, as it was on the verge of doing, did not fall into the hands of the British or of uh, local Californios who were allied with the British. And the British wanted those ports. Uh, and if you uh, look at what President Polk said about the Mexican War, he emphasizes uh, uh, the insistence that there will not be a balance of power in North America, because at that time in the 1840s, the British and the French uh, were allied uh, in the idea that we will have a balance of power in North America. We will keep the United States confined uh, between uh, British and French allies, not direct colonies, you know, but allies uh, uh, in what is now the western half of the United States. So there was a geopolitical element to that. The Spanish-American War did not come about because the Maine blew up and because William Randolph Hearst, Randolph Hearst said, send me the pictures, I'll give you a war, and it was all wag the dog. This is complete propaganda. Uh, Germany uh, was in the middle of a massive naval buildup, and it was looking for uh, naval bases in Mexico, in the Caribbean, uh, and in the Pacific. Uh, and the context of the Spanish-American War was this American-German naval rivalry, which most people have never heard about. Uh, but essentially, it was preemptive. It was denying uh, German bases uh, in the Caribbean. So the strategy in the 19th century of, of pushing the European great powers, first Britain and France, uh, and then later uh, Germany, out of the North America and creating a, a perimeter as, as far as possible made perfect sense. Uh, but the military and the more advanced thinkers realized as a result of uh, the industrialization of warfare, where you have uh, first coal-powered uh, uh, steamships, then diesel-powered uh, destroyers and submarines, and then aircraft and bombers, that this is not going to work. Uh, so you have to uh, make sure you avert the threat from arising uh, in the other centers of industrial and military power in the first place. Well, why can't you do that through a balance of power, just to conclude uh, uh, the options? Because a balance of power does the same thing to the United States uh, that uh, a, a world of uh, hostile hegemony does. It's Woodrow Wilson's nightmare again. Because in a balance of power world, the United States has to be permanently armed for war now because you can only uh, preserve the balance of power by shifting alliances among great powers that are armed to the teeth. So not only does the United States have to have enormous military forces in being ready to go at a moment's notice, if the balance shifts too far that way, you know, you, 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 the balance of power policy requires wars. You have to fight wars. If one uh, great power becomes too strong, the others have to team up with it. Now, it can be a cold war. It can be proxy wars. It can be arms races. But if it becomes too powerful, you have to attack that country to cripple it, regardless of whether it's done anything aggressive or not. That's balance of power theory. And, and it was practice in Europe for many centuries. Uh, so the balance of power, and the other reason the balance of power uh, strategy, in both of its versions, the traditional version and the offshore balancer version, uh, is incompatible with the American Constitution. It is arguably incompatible with any democratic system, prime ministerial or, or uh, presidential, is it requires uh, a president or a, a prime minister, an executive, who has the power to com uh, total control over foreign policy and extreme secrecy, right? Uh, if you're in a great power struggle in this Orwellian world between Oceania and East Asia and Eurasia, and you're, and you're the Oceania president, and you decide you know, it's time to switch. We've been fighting Eurasia uh, uh, allied with East Asia, but now East Asia is more powerful, so we're going to switch. Well, you have to do it overnight. And there are examples of that, like Nixon's trip to China. Uh, but that led in part to Watergate, because uh, the Nixon administration tried to ramp up 
this apparatus of secrecy and executive power, not simply because they were evil gangsters, you know, to some extent, you know, uh, maybe they were, but because they thought, well, this is what we need. We have to have this imperial president in this shifting balance of power world. Uh, so you come to a different conclusion from realist premises if you factor in this American way of life uh, uh, scenario. So the traditional realist would say, uh, you want a balance of power. Uh, th that's what realism is all about, preserving the balance of power. Uh, the American version of realism is, no, if we were Prussia, that might be our strategy, but we're the United States. We're this civilian, democratic, decentralized republic, and we can't do that without changing our whole domestic system and becoming an autocratic executive state. So we're going to try to avert foreign hegemony, but we're also going to try to uh, avert a uh, balance of power. And since spheres of influence don't work in the industrial era with long-distance technological warfare, we need to try to create a concert of power of all of the other military industrial great powers. And that was Roosevelt's vision, and Roosevelt was much more realistic than uh, Franklin Roosevelt, than Woodrow Wilson, with his vision of the big four, essentially policing the world after uh, World War II, uh, the British Empire, the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. And you'll notice that only one of those was a democracy. The British Empire was not a democracy outside of the UK. Uh, the Soviet Union was a, a totalitarian dictatorship, and China at that time, under our friend Chiang Kai-shek, was a ruthless military dictatorship. Uh, so the vision of Wilson and Roosevelt was that all peace-loving great powers should come together to keep the peace. Now, it failed after World War II because Stalin was a revisionist power. He thought that communism was locked in eternal struggle with the imperialist world. Uh, had Stalin been Deng Xiaoping, it might have worked. It might have worked. If, if, if he had pulled out of Poland and you know, wanted a, a cordon sanitaire in Eastern Europe and collaborated in the Security Council, it was not inherently implausible, this concert of power system. Now, just to wrap up briefly, uh, what did we do after World War, after, after the World War III, which is what it was, after the Cold War, after the Third World War? Uh, some of us uh, argued for going back to this system, of, of, which is why we had fought the two world wars, for the same logic. That is, we don't want a balance of power. There's no danger of hegemony, uh, and spheres of influence are irrelevant. So had we done that, we would have reached out after 1989 and brought in our former uh, enemies, the Russians and the Chinese, who had uh, only recently been an ally, and reconstructed the world system based not on democracy, because the, Ru the Chinese and arguably the Russians are not democratic, but that they're the great powers. And if the great powers get along, the costs of defense are lower for democracies everywhere, including us. We hope they become democratic, but they don't have to become democratic. They just have to avoid uh, uh, ag aggrandizing themselves in a way that forces everybody else into arms races. Okay? Instead, uh, the United States, uh, after 1992, impressed with the evident power that we uh, displayed in the Gulf War, uh, there was a bipartisan consensus on something which Frankly, neither the Wilson administration or the Roosevelt administration or the Eisenhower or Truman administration had even considered as a, as a remote possibility, which was permanent U.S. hegemony in peacetime when there's no superpower threat, but merely a potential superpower threat. Uh, and why, uh, you know, sometimes this was connected with the goal of spreading democracy, but the basic argument uh, was one that was completely new in American history. That is, the Germans and the Russians and the Chinese and the Japanese can't be trusted with guns. So therefore, they can never again be allowed, uh, if, they're, if they're Japan and Germany, to be independent military powers, as opposed to client states of the United States. And we make this unilateral offer to the Russians and Chinese that you become the new Germany, the new Japan. We will police your borders and take care of your security interests in the Middle East with regard to oil. Uh, and in return for that, you forego uh, armaments and uh, uh, concentrate on you know, selling cars and computers and so on, which was basically the situation of Japan and West Germany during the Cold War. Uh, now, this was assumed a degree of, of uh, self-effacement on the part of China and Russia, which was always unrealistic, and now, of course, they're pushing back. Uh, so uh, I think it's time that we reconsider the uh, concert of power model, which I, I just want to stress again, this is not woolly-headed utopianism, uh, particularly in Franklin Roosevelt's version. Roosevelt wanted to disarm all of the small countries in the world. Uh, he wanted the great powers to have a monopoly, the status quo great powers, uh, and they would attack 
uh, they would together, they would collaborate to attack countries that threaten the peace. Uh, his vision of liberal internationalism was not that, you know, it, it's based on, on realizing American ideals everywhere. He was in favor of that, you know, the four freedoms and all of that. But he thought it was in America's interest uh, to avoid something that's in the news now, resource wars. He was very concerned that if you don't have an integrated global trading system, then countries either through conquest or bilateral alliances will try to lock up the raw materials that these industrial great powers need. So the industrial powers had to collaborate on their common resource needs as well as their common security needs. So there we are. I, th I think that after a, a decade and a half of uh, pursuing this uh, uh, 1990s U.S. hegemony strategy, uh, we might consider uh, going back to what was indeed, uh, as I, the title of my book, The American Way of Strategy, uh, shared by presidents from uh, Woodrow Wilson all the way up to Dwight Eisenhower. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Fascinating. My, my head is always exhausted uh, uh, after, after a session with you. It's, it's really fascinating. Can you, can you um, just, just, just before I open the floor, can you, can you reflect a little bit more on, on the last uh, bit sort of talking a little bit about what happens when you've got a strategy, say we move now from uh, a sort of perverse hegemonic interest to something that looks more like a revitalized or morphed concerts of power strategy. But what if China, Russia, Iran, which themselves, I, I would say in China and, and Iran, uh, to some degree there's at least a regional hegemonic interest. Uh, with, with some flirtation, in Russia's case, with both concerts and spheres of influence. What do you do when the other great powers no longer want to play? Well, you have a plan B. And plan B is the balance of power. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the plan B for uh, Wilson and for Roosevelt and, and for the other uh, uh, proponents of, uh, of a community of power, as Wilson called it, and uh, uh, of what I'm calling the concert of power. Uh, the, the concert of power only works with status quo powers. They don't have to be democratic, they don't have to be internally liberal, uh, but they cannot be aggressive uh, in threatening other great powers. Uh, and and uh, uh, not necessarily their neighbors, but other great powers. We threaten our neighbors. <laughs> you know, but, but uh, if, if uh, we invade Haiti, it, it's, it's, you know, it's not so a threat to So you use Japan in that way? Uh, no, what you do is, see, here's the thing. You have to have, have both. Uh, let, me, let me just erase two of these. So B comes before A in, in, on the board, but in practice, plan A is the concert of power, plan B is the balance of power. Let's say you have a revisionist China that is everyone's nightmare. I mean, it's the nightmare of Pentagon planning. You know, it's, it's the Wilhelmine China, right? It's the new uh, uh, Kaiser Reich. Uh, and it's, it is really aggressive. And it builds up its military to intimidate the Russians and the Indians and the Americans and everyone else. Why not use the uh, Russians instead of the Chinese? Okay, well, the Russians. Which are? And use the Brazilians, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the Canadians, whatever, uh, under the concert of power system, you want their behavior to change, uh, but you don't want them to be removed from the system entirely because they're China or they're India or they're Russia. You want to reform their behavior. Uh, and, and this is, really gets to the heart of the debate in U.S. foreign policy right now. Is it behavior modification you want or is it regime change, right? And, and for a, a decade and a half, we've... The, the argument has been won by fairly simplistic people saying that all non-democratic regimes are inherently aggressive. And history refutes this. Most uh, kleptocratic dictatorships in Africa, however evil they are, have not been aggressive in international relations. Most Codillo states in Latin America traditionally, there were no wars in Latin America. No interstate wars, there were very few. Uh, there was one in the late 19th century and you know a football war you know, uh, uh, between Bolivia and Ecuador, I think. Uh, so the, 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 the rule has to be fairly minimal. Okay, you're a great power. We want you to belong to our club, the Concert of Great Powers. Uh, you don't have to be democratic. You don't have to be liberal. If you want to socialize your industries, okay. But you, you cannot either engage in direct cross-border aggression or fund subversion or uh, use your, your military buildup for intimidation. If you do that, then the other members of the club are going to form a temporary balance of power alliance against you. And then you're in this, unfortunately, you have to do it, you're in this balance of power world, like the, the First World War and the Second World War and the Cold War. But the premise is, 
Uh, we will call off what we hope is a Cold War, not a conventional war. We will call this off the moment you reform. Mm. And then you will be welcomed back in the club as a redeemed sinner. You will not be ostracized forever. Uh, because we recognize that the concert system only works if all of the major military industrial powers are part of it. And that's my objection, by the way, to the concert of democracies idea. I'd be all in favor of a concert of democracies if every great power were a democracy. I hope I live to see the day that every great power is a liberal democracy. But the purpose of the concert of power system is to avert great power conflict and the costs that imposes on people in democracies, you know, namely ours. You know, what's really interesting uh, is part of, uh, you know, if there was another talk here, and we say had Fred Berkston here, we I see Warren Coates here, who's um, sort of Mr. Hard Currency in bad neighborhoods. Uh, but, but thinking about the economic dimensions of influence around the world, um, at least in the 80s and, and, and early 90s, the view was that America's economic model was, was one that was creating both rewards and punishments uh, around the world, that it would create a converge, that they would all look like us, more like us. Jim Fallows wrote the book, uh, Fred Berkson's Views on Convergent uh, Society. So it was, in sense, you know, the economic dimensions of what you're talking about, to some degree, had a, had a corollary of, of uh, trying to to, to, to move these societies to, to converge with the American way of system, which is very consistent with what you said. I think that's come apart in a huge way, uh, as we've seen over the last two weeks. Well, well, well let, let me just say that that's been part of the American tradition, too, is evangelism. Mm -hmm. We want countries uh, uh, to become liberal and democratic and respect human rights. We want trade. We want global trade. Uh, but the basic theory has been that this is underneath the shelter provided by the security system and, does, and we, when you try to use the World War prevention system, which is what the United Nations and the post-war international system is, when you try to use that for these uh, other goals rather than civil society or public diplomacy or something, then you're trying to use the security system for something that is not its purpose. Hmm. Interesting. Yes, sir. Right here. Yeah, I have a question for you. Uh, Frederick Peterson, uh, U.S. Freedom Foundation. Um, your analysis here is, is fascinating, interesting, and uh, uh, it, it certainly does apply to the nation state. I can see where it's a very useful analysis. However, we may be dealing with uh, an issue today that is somewhat sui generis, or at least hasn't risen uh, in an awful long time, and that is uh, super state actors, uh, or actors that uh, are informed not by national aspirations or by balances of power, but rather by belief that extend uh, certainly cross-border. And this is a challenge that, uh, that I think uh, perhaps you can come up with another category to describe how we react to this and what a, what a proper um, analysis would be to deal right. with that. Well, well, I assume you have jihadism in mind. I, I deal with that and, and, and stateless terrorism at great length in my book. Uh, and what I say briefly is that there are two threats. I've dealt with one, the great power threat. Uh, but there's another threat, which is anarchy, which threatens all states, all sovereign states. And anarchy can warp your way of life as well. Uh, I create, a th I talk about three categories of warped societies, if you think of a democratic republic as your goal. One is the garrison state. That's the militarized state uh, trying to deal with great power threats that I was talking about. Harold Laswell, political science in the 1930s, came up with this term, the garrison state. Uh, I coined the phrase tributary state for a country that tries to preserve its civilian and liberal values by appeasing powerful, hostile great powers outside of its borders. And that's a dangerous strategy because you're, you're, you're preserving your independence at their sufferance. That's the tributary state. If you had excessively widespread transnational terrorism, but also transnational crime, uh, you get a third kind of warped society, which I call the castle society. Uh, if the people of a society, like the United States, lose faith in the ability of their territorial state to protect them, then they're going to move into uh, gated communities, they're going to stock up on arms, and you cannot have freedom in that kind of society either if you think you're going to be blown up. You know, uh, and, and you see societies, Israel and others, that have, have wrestled with terrorism. You can get both of these distortions at the same time, the garrison state and the castle society, the kind of Mad Max uh, thing. Now, where I, I part with people is uh, uh, jihadism, you know, successes, which are mostly psychological, not, you know, actually uh, military. Uh, 
Uh, they conclude from that that the nation, the territorial state is weakening and we must have some sort of supranational answer to this. Uh, my take on jihadism is quite the reverse. It's that territorial states are too weak. Uh, that is, if every human being on this planet, and this sounds very illibertarian, but remember democratic republicanism is not libertarianism. You want law and order. You just want it to have checks and balances and so on. Uh, you, can't, you could not have had al-Qaeda if uh, Afghanistan and Sudan and other countries had been sufficiently policed by sufficiently strong states, which also had assets that could be threatened by the victims of these terrorists. So you could say, unless you shut this down, these training camps on your territory right away, you know, you're, we're going to inflict pain on you. Uh, and that threat makes no sense if the central government is so feeble that it doesn't even have the power to shut down Mike, if uh, I can the, just the territory. Back on just yeah. one element here before I go to Alan Gerson. Uh, the, the, the history shows, I mean, at least contemporary history, that, that Britain and the United States, I'd argue the Soviet Union during the Cold War, um, I'd say uh, Iran took lessons from, all, from these, the, these states in terms of creating transnational movements that, might, that helped undermine our rival states. Mm -hmm. And so during the Cold War, Britain and the United States helped actually hatch the transnational jihadist movement, the Muslim Brotherhood, the, its antecedents. We have yeah. complicity in helping to having uh, launched this because we were trying to undermine uh, states in the Middle East that were aligned with the Soviet Union or the non-aligned movement. And, and we're now seeing the sort of uh, grandkids, if you will, uh, of a movement that's far more organized in a contemporary <laughs> well, basis. Look, look there, there's, and, there's, and a lot so, of, there's a lot yeah. of blame to go around. But my, my point yeah. is that, that you know, it, it, it's interesting that states saw this as a tool or a device that, that has, has, real, has, has created real problems, and I think psychological problems matter. Yeah, no, that, but see, that, that goes into my argument about the centrality of states. The first Western statesman to call for jihad throughout the Muslim world was Kaiser Wilhelm in the 1890s. He called on the Muslims to rise up and gain their independence. Well, why? Because Britain ruled most Muslims in the world at that time. And so it was a way of weakening the British Empire. You know, we encouraged, you know, at least, you know, some of the peripheral jihadists, you know, in Afghanistan, crusade against the Soviets. Uh, but see, this gets back to the point about the centrality of states, too. Uh, it is not true that you can't have international terrorists without some state sponsors. There have been some. The anarchists murdered a great number of people. You know, the jihadists, to a certain extent, from hotel rooms in Europe and America, if not from Afghanistan and Pakistan, could do a lot of damage. Nevertheless, it is the case that when you have, whether it's uh, an insurgency, uh, it may be a nationalist insurgency, it may be a transnational religious uh, uh, crusade, but when a great power decides it's going to pump resources into it, then you're in a totally different world. Uh, and that's what the Cold War was. Uh, because in, in the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States were fueling local conflicts, which would have been much less severe. We're pumping resources into it every time we fill a pump. Arguably. We got Alan Gerson, who was uh, Gene Kirk. Patrick's uh, Chief Counsel of the United yeah, Nations. Nice. All right, thank you. Um, thank you very much, I mean, for that illuminating discussion. I mean, you've certainly educated me, first, with regard to uh, Wilsonianism, and secondly, uh, reaffirmed something about Roosevelt that few people realize, because the current foreign policy debate usually centers in books like Kissinger's, even Brzezinski's, on the fact that there is a dichotomy or tension between the so-called realist or pragmatic school and the Wilsonian school, and it's popularly assumed that Wilsonian, the Wilson actually wanted to uh, uh, further make the world safe for democracy, me meant to spread democracy, and you debunk that by saying, no, it just meant democracy at home, and then you say that Roosevelt himself really wasn't interested in the UN Charter as such, but in making peace mm -hmm. with, uh, okay. Now, given all of that as background, if we could look at a current situation, which is the Russia-Georgia situation. What justification is there in terms of the traditional conceptions, as you put it, of American foreign policy for a support of Georgia on democracy grounds as opposed to making the argument, which I think is, is, is kind of difficult, that this is a case, uh, as McCain has said twice, simply aggression, uh, aggression. Uh, ha have we fallen in love with the concept of uh, making the world safe for democracy either in Iraq or with Georgia that really doesn't have a precedent in U.S. foreign policy and is inconsistent with the original neoconservative concepts? Yeah, yeah, yes, that's uh, absolutely right. My answer is yes. 
Uh, liberal internationalism was not militant democratism. Now, there was a linkage between democracy and uh, liberal internationalism. Uh, that is, liberal in, in a liberal international system where security costs for all states are relatively low, the, the real Wilsonians, Colonel House, and, and, and I would include Franklin Roosevelt and Theodore Roosevelt in that, they thought that was the necessary but not sufficient condition for democracy. You know, if all states are warring camps prepared for battle, uh, then you're going to have executive rule. You're not going to have democracy even if you have elections every four years. It's the necessary but not sufficient condition. But there are lots of other local conditions, and I talk about this in my book. You have to have a fairly secularized political system. You have to have uh, a numerically dominant middle class. You have to have a, a functioning economy. Uh, you're not going to have liberal democracy in warlord societies with agrarian economies like Afghanistan. Wilson never would have believed that. In fact, part of both the Wilson and the Roosevelt schemes was a system of international trusteeships where the great powers would supervise societies that not only were not capable of democracy, but they weren't even capable of functioning, establishing functioning sovereign states. They thought that would go on for decades or generations. So the idea that Woodrow Wilson or Franklin Roosevelt thought, well, you just send in some observers and have free elections in any disordered you know, tribal society and then go home, that's absurd. And they also would have thought it's absurd to say that uh, our alliances are dictated by whether there's a coup or not. Right? So uh, if Georgia has a military coup tomorrow, then all of a sudden we have no commitment to Georgia against Russia, because now they're a dictatorship. And then six weeks from now, they have uh, uh, free elections again and the coup is defeated. Now they're our ally again, right? We went through this uh, in the Cold War, where there were coups in Greece and Turkey. And we didn't kick them out and then bring them back in to NATO, right? It's, we, just, we didn't like it. Uh, but the purpose of the alliance was military. It, it was not uh, uh, political e evangelism. Uh, and you mentioned the neoconservatives. I was a neoconservative in the 1980s and proud of it. The original neoconservatives were chastened liberal internationalists. Uh, they, they felt it was necessary to defend the need for a U.S. Uh, 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 assertiveness after Vietnam. But they were not what is called neoconservatives today. When I talk about the neoconservatives, I'm talking about a different movement that arose in the 1990s. There's some family and, and social linkages between them. But the original ones, like Gene Rostow, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Gene Kirkpatrick, uh, were Rooseveltians. I mean, and, and they had this Wilsonian Rooseveltian vision. Would you agree, before. Alan? Yes. Since he wrote a biography of exactly. Kirkpatrick. Yeah, interesting. Uh, Steve Landy in the back. Let me, um, thank you so much. Um, let me mention three current situations. I'm and, and, curious. And can I um, uh, just do one favor? And I'm going to apologize. I have to. Uh, uh, I'm going to turn the moderation of this over to Mike. We're going to run to 1:30. Um, try to be brief. I, unfortunately, I'm leaving in a few minutes because I've got to rush to catch a flight at Dulles, and and I don't often do this, but I don't have a choice. So I apologize to Mike and all of you in advance. But Steve, go ahead. Okay. I have a paper for you, so stop by, and I I'll give you one. Okay. Um, let me bring up three practical situations. I'm curious how your theory would apply to it. One, I think we already have covered and so on, the fact that U.S. concern about Tibet, which is the Chinese influence, the point about Georgia was raised. Similarly, Russia's subtle involvement with Venezuela in sending, uh, in sending bombers or something and other areas like that. The second question has to be how would it work, your theory, We'll say with either Iran or the Israeli-Palestinian situation, who would be in charge? The U.S. Is, was disappointed in the past that the Europeans were not tougher with Iran. The Japanese, I should say, or the Chinese and the Russians were not tougher when they had this nuclear threat. And of course, anybody who can figure out how to solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem has done a good job. And the third one, very quick, is what's currently happening in Africa, which I think is the exact opposite of what you're seeing. Number one. The Chinese are moving quickly as possible to sew up the natural resources. The Europeans are negotiating these so-called economic partnership agreements, which really is an attempt to, uh, which is really attempt to sew up the African market for their own exporters and so on. So how would it work um, in terms of problems close to the country's borders? How would it work in relationship to the outlier states who would take responsibility? What happens if no one, and number three, what would happen in Africa where we're seeing a return to colonialism? Thanks, Stephen. We'll get, we'll get Mike's question and his question here in a minute. Mike, uh, Lynn will, will handle them. But I, I have to leave, but I want Go. you to address something which I will watch on the video. <laughs> right. I'm sure there are people watching online here. But I also want you to address uh, John Eikenberry's thesis, which 
which uh, argues something different. He suggested that, that America has the ability to maintain a sort of hegemonic, uh, continued hegemonic status uh, by basically negotiating with the, with the world. His, his thesis is called the liberal leviathan. Mm -hmm. You remain the leviathan by, by helping the world solve its global public goods problems. And so you're tied down, but you're still so far bigger and more uh, uh, endowed than everyone else, then that, that's there. I, I have, you know, you know John Acton very well. I like it. I'm intrigued with it. I'd love you to touch on that, and then I'll watch the video later. I want to thank all of you for joining us. Well, thank you. Have a good trip. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, with regard to the first question, I'm going to disappoint you because uh, I don't, I don't have the time uh, to do a tour d'horizon of uh, the entire planet, you know, in different conflicts. But also, more fundamentally, uh, I wrote uh, the American Way of Strategy uh, in order to give people a a language, which is not my language, it's something I'm excavating and recovering, and other scholars, uh, as I mentioned, Daniel Dudney are recovering as well, uh, is to teach you how to come to conclusions about the Middle East, about Africa, about China. It's not to give you Michael Lynn's five-point plan. Uh, presumably, if I will have succeeded, along with uh, uh, other people working in this field, if we change the way uh, we think about foreign policy, and then you can have debates from the same principles, you may come to different conclusions, right? So, so people who share exactly the same premise may come to opposite conclusions about what to do about Russia and Georgia, or what to do about uh, uh, Israel and, uh, its, and the Palestinians uh, and, and Iran. So uh, uh, I, I deliberately left out of this book uh, what all too many foreign policy books have, uh, which dates them very quickly, by the way. Uh, you know, turning to South America, turning to the Southern Cone, turning to the Caribbean, we must do X, Y, and Z. Uh, that's not the purpose of, of this book. It's not the purpose of this talk. It's if you learn to think about this logic, then you will do the right thing. You will come to the right conclusions. Uh, and, and it's a logic. It's not a set of answers. Uh, of, and I, frankly, I'm not qualified. Nobody, uh, no individual is qualified, you know, just to go from continent to continent to continent and say, do this, do this, do that. I mean, that's kind of an academic game. But we can say, what do we want? Uh, and how, how does, in, in the world, what sort of world order do we want? And if we pursue this policy in the Middle East versus that one, uh, what, what are the consequences? Uh, Steve raised an interesting question. Uh, my version of Rooseveltian liberal internationalism uh, uh, contests uh, some other versions of, that call themselves liberal internationalism. Uh, one, uh, John Eikenberry, brilliant scholar at uh, Princeton. I encourage you all uh, uh, to read his, uh, his books and his uh, essays. Uh, Eikenberry argues that after World War II, the United States created this very thickly interwoven liberal international system, including uh, entities like the United Nations, NATO, uh, the WTO now, uh, and that this is a fairly stable thing. And so even if the United States remains the hegemonic power, it can encourage China and Russia and rising powers to take part in that. Uh, and I'm very close to that position, uh, but there's a fundamental difference uh, between me and uh, uh, Professor Eikenberry. Uh, I think the United States, uh, this, what we think of now as the international system of which we're the leader, is not the post-1945 world order. Uh, it is the post-Korean War world order. Uh, NATO and the European Union, uh, formerly the common market, these institutions were thrown together hastily. Uh, uh, in, in the case of NATO, shortly before the Korean War, but essentially it, they're, they're Cold War institutions. If you go back to the planning of the Roosevelt administration uh, from 1942 to 1945, NATO, what's that? Uh, the United States did not plan to have any permanent troops stationed in Europe after 1945. Uh, the, the United States, if you look at the Pentagon plans, I've studied Pentagon planning all the way up until uh, 1949, 1950. The most the hawks in the Pentagon wanted was island bases off the shore of Eurasia so that long-range bombers, you know, could attack uh, Germany or, or Japan if they revived and became hostile or the Soviet Union if it became aggressive. Uh, so what we think of as the normal system that we've all grown up in was kind of an accidental thing that was thrown together in the course of the Cold War. And I think this is basically where we went wrong after 1989. There should have been a concert of Vienna or a Congress of Berlin, and we should have sat down with the Chinese and the Russians, as well as our NATO allies and, and other allies, and said, we're going to create new, comprehensive, universal, but also regional institutions. And instead, the consensus in Washington was, both liberals and conservatives, no, we'll just keep this kind of America-centered Cold War order that grew up and the reason it's so America-centered was 
because uh, Germany and Japan and Western Europe were wiped out after World War II, and, and so the U.S. stepped in and became their protector. We're going to keep that forever, but we're just going to ask Russia and China and India and Brazil to accept the subordinate role within this America-centered international system that Japan having been occupied and West Germany having been occupied, you know, more or less had to accept during the course of the Cold War. So we're, it, it's, it's a family squabble, as it were. It's, it's a debate within liberal internationalists. But I think that the 1990s, 2000 liberal internationalists, uh, they, they share a sort of ultimate vision that's similar, but their, their strategy is, very, is quite different from the Wilson-Roosevelt, you know, great power condominium strategy. Yes. Um, Judd Harriet, documentary filmmaker. Mm -hmm. Judd Harriet, documentary filmmaker. <laughs> Listening to you, it seems to me that the concert of power model is inherently unstable because there would seem to be always someone who's going to cheat and try to gain hegemony. So the balance of power model, as you say, option B, would always be lurking in the background. That's right. And second, England, the UK, the UK followed this policy throughout the 19th century, maybe before, without resorting to being a militarized state. Could you comment on that, please? Yes. Uh, uh, both points are, are, are quite excellent. Uh, as I said, the concert of power strategy is very uh, unstable and can break down uh, if one of the members or more of the members is too aggressive and threatens the others. And then you fall back, and reluctantly, you fall back to plan B, which is a, a balance of power. Uh, and that means the others, you, you try to create a coalition, preferably through uh, Cold War uh, rather than World War, conventional war, uh, in order to convince the aggressor uh, that the resources, not of the United States by itself, but the United States and other great power allies are so overwhelming that it has to change its behavior and back down and become a, a member in good standing of the concert again. And let's remember, the United States did not win the Cold War. The, a coalition won the Cold War of the United States, Japan, Asia, I mean, uh, China, communist China, and Western Europe. In other words, the Soviets were faced with a coalition of every other great power on the earth. That's why they went bankrupt. It wasn't just the US versus the Soviets. It was all of the military industrial resources of the other major powers were allied against them. We defeated uh, Germany in two world wars not because the United States was so powerful, uh, but because uh, we were part of this coalition with overwhelming resources. But you're quite right. I, th I think it, it, if you look at the long span of history, you would see the system go back and forth uh, in, uh, between concert and balance. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in, the, in the next, the autumn issue of Parameters, uh, the US uh, Army Journal, uh, I have an article entitled uh, A Concert Slash Balance Strategy for a Multipolar World. So you've uh, put your finger on it. Uh, nothing, nothing is eternal. It's interesting, I was reading about Franklin Roosevelt. He thought the UN system, by which he meant the big four, assuming Stalin had played along, he thought it would last about 25 years and break down. And he said, you know, you can't go for more than a lifetime without having to redo things. You know, so by the 60s it would have break down. You'd have to have something else. Uh, so nothing is eternal. Uh, the point is from the United States. Uh, the concert system is, is preferable than the attempt to have permanent American hegemony, which I argue uh, in the book uh, would bankrupt us if we seriously attempted it, uh, as, as we have it now. Now, remind me your uh, second question. Uh, the UK followed a policy of balance of power and did not resort to a militarized state. Th that's right, and that's why I mentioned in the case of balance of power, there has been a category of a few states that have been unbalanced balancers, like the United Kingdom. It is an offshore island. Uh, that could not be threatened ser you know, seriously with invasion. Although, I have to point out, there was the Norman invasion, uh, there was William of Orange in 1689. As long as you have local allies, uh, uh, Britain can be invaded and has been invaded uh, through history. Uh, but the point is, Britain in the West and Russia, uh, traditionally Tsarist Russia, and then Soviet Russia in the East, did not have great powers on their land borders capable of, of uh, uh, just forcing them to militarize those borders. So they could inject money, but also troops, into these continental European uh, uh, power struggles uh, without having to militarize their society. Now, Tsarist Russia was militarized for social reasons that had nothing to do with uh, 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 geopolitics in, in, in the sense that we're talking about. Uh, is the United States like this? If you listen to advocates of offshore balancing, uh, that is where the United States would hold the balance and wait for the Europeans or the Asians to fight, and then we would sort of come in at the last minute, as we did in the two world wars. Not in the Cold War, but the two world wars. Uh, 
then we should do that as well, you know, pull back uh, and not have any part, uh, even diplomatically, in trying to shape outcomes there. Now, this has been rejected even before 1945. U.S. planners said, we can never do this again. We have to have a place at the table. Uh, we can't just wait for the thing to go to hell and then hope that we have time to intervene and tip it to one side or another, uh, quite apart from the enormous cost. If tipping it to one side means landing at Normandy, <laughs> right? So we're, trying, so we're actually trying to avert that sort of situation. And the conclusion the military came to long ago was that uh, in the age of missiles and aircraft, uh, the United States is not Britain. In fact, Britain is not Britain uh, once you had V-2 bombs. You know, that the, if there's any hostile power anywhere on the face of the planet that has a military industrial capability uh, that permits them to rain missiles down on us through space, uh, then uh, es essentially the oceans have dried up in that sense. Uh, the oceans are still a barrier to invasion, but they're not a barrier to uh, obliteration from the air. Uh, and I, I tend to agree with that analysis. Although, you know, a, a very eminent people, including a, a Stephen Walt at, at Harvard and John Mearsheimer and a number of uh, realist scholars, uh, make a good case for this offshore balance for strategy. Uh, but I, I think that in, in our technological civilization, we don't want to wait until you know, the world's about to fall, you know, uh, uh, to some Hitler uh, or, or Kaiser again and then try to fight our way up the beaches or bomb our way in. Uh, we want to be in Asia diplomatically, not in terms, we don't have to have vast numbers of troops there, but we want to be in organizations at the regional and global level where we're at the table with the Germans, the British, the French, the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, you know, maybe the Brazilians, uh, uh, so that we're part of and this started even with Theodore Roosevelt, you know, when uh, uh, he, he gets involved in the Russo-Japanese War and, and the Moroccan crisis. It's even older than uh, uh, the World Wars, uh, this idea that we can't be left out because this affects our interests. So we want to have a place at the table. We don't have to be the boss, but we want to be there when these decisions are made. Yes? Um. Thanks. Um, Mike, uh, Gary Mitchell from the Mitchell Report. I, I'm interested to know whether in the book, or uh, you, you, you parse uh, power in terms of hard power and soft power, and uh, and whether you whether you are a uh, you know whether you whether you admit to that notion that there there is this distinction of hard power and soft power, and given uh, sort of where we are today and where we're headed, um, in in either Plan A or Plan B. Uh, you know, does does one lead and the other follow? What's the balance look like? Do you do you deal with that notion at all? Well, not not by name, but I, I do talk about prestige and, and reputational factors and so on. I, I am f you know fairly uh, traditional realist in this sense. I think that soft power is kind of like the glamour of a Hollywood movie star. You know, it lingers for a decade or two after you're retired, uh, but it's essentially parasitic on hard power. Uh, uh, that is a country that appears to be very militarily strong uh, and has a rising economy and a functioning uh, system and a lot of elan and, and spirit uh, tends to attract uh, interest and its reputation tends to grow. Uh, uh, in the case of China now, uh, where the Netherlands is much richer per capita than China, right? But you know the Dutch model is not sweeping the world and people aren't talking about it. Right, the Soviet Union was a poor third world country with an enormous military during the Cold War, and yet there were hundreds of millions of people around the world who believed in the Soviet version of Marxism-Leninism, including a few in the United States. You know, power is sexy. Power is attractive. Uh, in the 1930s, there were, in, in Latin America, so South America fascinates me because it's part of Western civilization, part of Western society, culturally. But geopolitically, it's very isolated from the centers of power. But they're part of the conversation. Uh, and what you see in the 20th century is uh, there's one fad after another in South America, depending on which military great power tends to be rising. And then peop uh, people in South America want to emulate what seems to be the coming wave of the future, even though actually they haven't fought with each other for generations, right? Uh, so there's a big vogue of fascism in South America. Uh, in, in the 1930s. Fascism seemed to be the coming thing. You know, then there's communism and, you know, the American model. Uh, now I understand there's interest in the Chinese model in South America. So I, I think reputational factors are important. 
But I think soft power in the usual sense that you can compensate for declining military power or declining industrial strength, you know, by having, you know, better uh, uh, ballets and, and, you know, better TV shows and, you know, uh, uh, art theater. Uh, I'm somewhat caricaturing it. Uh, I, I think that's sort of a council of desperation. If you look at first British culture and then French culture, their international prestige came after the period when they were dominant military powers. And it lingered for a while, but once they'd been in retirement too long, it kind of collapsed. Uh, and, the, and the collapse of British uh, cultural prestige took place in the 90s, uh, and, and the meter for that was uh, in Asia. Uh, I learned that more and more Asians uh, who were having their children learn English, uh, until that time, a great many had wanted British English because of the prestige, right? They looked down on the U.S. And at some point, forget it. We want our kids to speak American English. You know, Britain's, uh, uh, th there's still this older traditional lingering remnants of prestige, but, but it's fading rapidly. So I would not trade prestige for uh, hard power, economic and, and military. Yes, at the back. Uh, Toby Gotti, Aikengum. Um You seem to be talking in pure categories, uh, you know, um, hegemons without, without um, adjectives. And, and I wondered if you could talk about the concept of, for example, a benevolent hegemon, which is in a way what the U.S., uh, how some countries saw the U.S., like China, you know, just you, you take care of the international system, let us develop. And, and Russia, I think, thought it was making that kind of bargain. Um, after 9-11, acknowledging the U.S. was a hegemon, but saying, you leave us alone, Chechnya, leave us alone internally, and, um, you know, don't upset the international system, which we did with the war in Iraq. So can you talk a little bit about, um, uh, you know, countries that, um, are, for example, are regional powers, which you could say want to balance in their region, but really couldn't care less what happens in the rest of the world, and can a hegemon allow that and make um, um, make exceptions? And then what happens to alliances like NATO? I mean, do you um, have to get involved even if y it destroys your concept of what you think you ought to do because you signed, uh, uh, you know, an agreement to protect a country that, you know, 20 years ago happened to join NATO, but, you know, maybe you wouldn't have? Right. Uh, th there was a debate between the Roosevelt uh, liberal internationalists and the Wilson internationalists, Wilson, Woodrow Wilson firmly believed you could not have any alliances in a collective security system. So all alliances had to be obliterated. It just the League of Nations and nothing else. No partial alliances. Uh, the Rooseveltians, you know, nonsense. We'll have bilateral relations. We'll have multilateral alliances within this overarching uh, great power club. Uh, and uh, just, just to clarify, the, uh, from the, the point of view of Roosevelt and, and uh, both Roosevelt's actually, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, obviously uh, Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt during World War II did not want to antagonize potential allies, or including small countries, by being too clear about his plans. But his version, and also Theodore Roosevelt's version of a concert of power, seemed to be a, an al a rough alliance of local hegemons. Uh, Roosevelt talked about Russia. He talked about Brazil. He didn't talk about the Dominican Republic. You know, uh, uh, and and it was kind of great power chauvinism. You know, basically, the United States would would be the hegemon in North America. Brazil maybe would be the hegemon in South America. Russia would have a legitimate sphere of influence in Eastern Europe, having been attacked through there twice. It wouldn't include communizing, you know, and enslaving Eastern Europe and plundering it. But they they could have a say about things done on its borders, like other countries putting up missile defense systems and and training troops on your borders and so on. Roosevelt thought you know, that even a status quo Soviet Union would not put up with American troops right on Russia's borders perpetually. Uh, Washington doesn't seem to think that under the President administration. Uh, so there are two ways you can go about it. Actually, the President who's closest to Roosevelt's vision of this alliance with regional hegemons, in my opinion, is Richard Nixon. Uh, because, you know, he wanted to get along with China in the hope that they could uh, put some pressure on a second-tier power, uh, North Vietnam. He wanted to get along with the, the Soviets if they could be persuaded to be status quo power. And remember Iran, he saw as kind of the natural hegemon of the Persian Gulf under the Shah of Iran. Uh, now, needless to say, the whole Nixon-Kissinger thing just crumbled in, with respect to China, Russia, and Iran. But, but that was closer to this Rooseveltian vision, you know, that in, if you can't beat them, join them. 
that does now when the, if, if they become aggressive and start creating regional empires that are hostile to their neighbors you don't get along with it but you you simply take it for granted that if you're not going to deal with uh, all of the South Americans as a unit you're going to phone up Brazil and a couple of major countries it seems to me what we've been pursuing uh, in recent years is the opposite of that in fact a French diplomat uh, told me uh, over lunch uh, he said uh, well, we see the, uh, I, I'm always speaking for the French government, but he says, we see the U.S. policy, this is under the present administration, as undermining every regional hegemon in the world. So you undermine France and Germany by teaming up with Spain and Poland and Europe. You uh, undermine China. Uh, you undermine Russia uh, by, you know, bringing uh, Georgia and, and uh, uh, Ukraine into NATO if you can and putting U.S. troops uh, uh, and equipment on their, and, and uh, defenses on their borders. Uh, in the Middle East, there are two potential hegemons that the U.S., quite rightly, in my opinion, was, was trying to uh, undermine uh, Iraq and Iran. Uh, so they saw this as a deliberate strategy on the part of this administration. So it's the opposite, in a, in a way, of the uh, Roosevelt-Nixon strategy, where you say, we'll cut a deal with you know, the, the biggest power in a region, but in return, it has to abide by the rules of the club, or we're going to kick them out of the club. Uh, the first Bush administration is interesting because you talk about benevolent hegemony because uh, uh, in a way there was this brief moment during the Gulf War when uh, the President George Herbert Walker Bush talked about a new world order and it sounded very much like this you know Roosevelt Wilson 1945 UN Charter world uh, where uh, Russia uh, post-Soviet Russia uh, China other countries would be uh, partners you know, in this global order. It's not clear to me, as a historian and journalist, whether they had in mind perpetual U.S. hegemony with sort of, you know, uh, make-believe concessions to the others, or, or whether they really were interested in revitalizing the system. The fact that General Brent Scowcroft, you know, ha has uh, supported U.N. reform, I think, suggests that they, they took this seriously. Uh, and, and it's an interesting uh, question for historians as well as biographers. Uh, as to how the second President Bush, uh, you know, uh, followed a policy that has uh, been the reverse in, in many ways uh, in its approach to great power relations of that of the first. Okay, I think take one or two more questions, uh, then we'll break up. Uh, yes. Under conservative powers, where does the discourse of human rights come in, and is there any intervention in things like the Rwandan genocide if, if Clinton had um, adhere to a concert of power, would he have intervened in Rwanda at all, or the Darfur genocide, or any of that? What what happens there? Well, it depends on the details of, of the system. What I'm defending, I, I haven't uh, gone over it in detail, is the vision of the Roosevelt administration and the early Truman administration, which I think could be updated. Now, they were concerned about development and, and about human rights and about failed states. Their answer was they essentially had a three-tier world. At the top, you had the great powers. There'd be a handful of, of great powers. We all know, you know who, who they were or who they would be. Below that, you would have a uh, majority of the states in the world because uh, the, the Americans were intent on decolonization over the objections of the British and the French. Now, sometimes America soft-pedaled its anti-colonialism because they needed British and French support in the Cold War against the Soviets. But both the Soviets and the Americans, on principle, were in favor of the Indians governing India you know, the Middle Easterners governing the Middle East, the British and the French, these are anachronisms. We want to get rid of, of these uh, uh, empires, uh, the, uh, these pre-modern colonial uh, uh, European empires. But the American planners recognize that if the British and the French decolonized uh, sections of Africa, parts of Asia, uh, you know, there would be no functioning competent state authority to succeed them. And, and you could have this catastrophe, humanitarian catastrophe. Uh, the, their answer was the United Nations trusteeship system. Uh, and it was, it was seen by the Roosevelt administration as an improvement over both colonialism and over the mandate system of the League of Nations uh, uh, that Woodrow Wilson had favored. Now, under the League of Nations, Wilson wanted immediate independence for countries that he thought were so capable of self-government, Yugoslavia, Poland, and so on. But he recognized that there were very backward, you know, Stone Age populations in, in some parts of the world governed by European empires where they wouldn't even understand what you're saying if you say, oh, you're now a sovereign state, have a banking system. You know, there had to be some kind of tutelary power or else 
there would just be massive slaughter or some other nearby state would just come in and exploit them. So the League of Nations system was, we will, uh, the, the uh, Council of the League will appoint one of the great powers to have, have sort of an informal empire, but it will have to report back to the, the concert of power. You know, and, you have, and you can't be plundering their gold and their diamonds and all of that. You, know, you really have to be developing them so that at some point they can become independent. Uh, now, Britain and France used the mandate system to enlarge their colonial empires in the Middle East, among other areas. They promised independence to the Kurds, they promised independence to the Arabs, but then they treated the former Ottoman Empire as, they carved it up between Britain and France. As Osama bin Laden, uh, you know, angrily reminds people, I mean, that created this great sense of betrayal among Arabs, uh, in, including, uh, you know, rational, uh, uh, you know, members of, of the Arab uh, community as, as well as, you know, these uh, evil, uh, demented jihadists. So. Roosevelt was completely disgusted with the way Britain and, and uh, France had uh, treated the mandate system after World War I. And so his solution was, you can't trust a single power, including the United States, to supervise a poor, weak, backward territory. So what we're going to do, and it was kind of utopian, you could argue, but he said, we will have two or three powers will jointly supervise the development of a territory. So his proposal in Indochina was that, uh, once it was freed from the, the French had to go, they had to leave, they had to get out. Uh, but he, he uh, suggested to Chiang Kai-shek that uh, China and uh, the United States could kind of jointly supervise the, the gradual development of these countries to the point at which they, they won independence. So it was gradual, orderly decolonization was, was the vision. Uh, that broke down because of the Cold War. Uh, so instead of having gradual decolonization, uh, particularly in areas of, of uh, Africa and, and uh, some of Southeast Asia, you, you had both sides were funneling guns and money and uh, uh, advice and sometimes advisors to these uh, anti-colonial struggles, or in some cases struggles over who would succeed the British. That's, uh, what happened, that's why we fought in Indochina. Who would succeed the French after they left? Who would succeed the British? Uh, and what had been intended to be the UN trusteeship system, which was a very gradual decolonization, just the whole thing was just abandoned. Uh, and, and by the early 1960s, the UN General Resolution, uh, uh, General Assembly passed a resolution, I believe it's 1514, that says more or less, I quote it in my book, I'm paraphrasing from memory, it says that uh, backwardness and lack of development shall not be used as an excuse to deny sovereignty to any population. So whether you're ready or not, you're independent, right? Uh, and, and arguably, a lot of uh, 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 the, the chaos in, in uh, uh, Africa and Sudan, it dates back to uh, decolonization. Uh, now, having said that, I also feel obliged to challenge uh, two of, of the concepts that are floating around that are shaping our discourse, which I reject completely. One is uh, humanitarian disaster. The other is rogue state. Let me explain to you why I reject this. Uh, the, the, the rhetoric of humanitarian crisis implies that this is not a political struggle. It's not a power struggle over the borders of the state or who controls the capital. It's that it's just they're evil people and they're just wicked and they're killing these other people just out of racism or you know, religious bias or something. But that outside powers can step in, punish the evil people, you know, send them to The Hague, put them on trial, and then the country will function because it was a functioning country. And this is the way Sudan, uh, it's the way uh, Kosovo was portrayed and so on. That's not actually what has happened. What really happened was, this is about borders. Uh, that is in Kosovo, the, the uh, Kosovars wanted to secede and join Albania. So they waged an insurgency against the Serbian government. The Serbian government uh, then brutally cracked down using ethnic cleansing and murder and rape as a weapon. But they, the, the, they were, from their point of view, they were fighting an insurgency. Uh, you know, uh, in Darfur, there's a struggle. It's an ethnic struggle between this big catch-all state that the British colonialists drew, uh, and the British pr uh, created uh, uh, the Arab elite to crush the black African elite, and they helped them when they were bugging out of Africa during the decolonization period, right? Uh, so when uh, the Southerners rebel against the central government, the central government cracks down, but there was a rebellion. I mean, there was a, a, a secessionist, you know, insurrectionist movement, right? And so, and this is not portrayed this way. It's portrayed as though this were like the Nazi Holocaust. The Jews of Europe 
were not engaged in insurrection against Adolf Hitler, except in his deranged mind, right? Uh, and so to use this Holocaust analogy, it doesn't justify the, the, the brutality and the war crimes committed in crushing these insurrections, but there, are, there is an initial insurrection, right? Uh, and it's not that all these people were sleeping in their beds, you know, and the Gestapo showed up one night. You know, there was an ongoing, it's not civil war, it's an ethnic war over the future of the state and the territory. So that, that's why I don't like this uh, Holocaust analogy and, and genocide analogy, because it obscures the fact that this is nothing like the Nazis invading a country and just rounding up all the Jews and, and uh, gypsies and homosexuals and exterminating them. It's, it's not like that. I mean, it's a brutal form of counter-insurrectionary policy. Uh, and if you think that the, the people who started the insurrection, the Kosovars, you know, uh, 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 you know some of the uh, uh, Sudanese deserve their own country, well, then why not treat it as such? Why not say we'll give them guns and let them fight for independence and we'll, you know, uh, it'll be a national independence movement, okay? But, it, it, you know, doing all of this in terms of humanitarian intervention just uh, confuses the issue. Uh, rogue states, I think I refuse to use this term rogue state. I think it's propaganda. It's pure propaganda. I mean, it sounds like something the Soviets would say, hooligan state, you know, or the imperialists, right? The imperialist camp. Uh, it is pure, it is a pejorative term. It is not an analytical term. It, it has no referent in reality because the definition of a rogue state is any state that does something that the U.S. is opposed to, right? So uh, it, it can be, uh, well, let, let's take an example of a rogue state, uh, one with a military dictatorship, uh, with ongoing uh, uh, brutal suppression of dissent, uh, which has its own secret nuclear program uh, that becomes successful, that flouts international law, that uh, helps the Taliban create training camps in a neighboring country. Well, I've just described Pakistan, right? When was the last time you heard a president refer to Pakistan as a rogue state? It's done everything we uh, falsely accuse Saddam Hussein of doing, including support for al-Qaeda, uh, and uh, actually obtaining nuclear weapons. But, you know, Saddam was leading a rogue state and, and Musharraf was not. Uh, and you can just go down the list. Uh, so I, I think, you know, as, again, just to conclude, one, one of the purposes of this book is to change the, the debate, to change the rhetoric we use. Because as long as we're in this rhetoric about rogue states, humanitarian inter interventions, then uh, the people who have this uh, uh, worldview uh, uh, that's been described as neoconservatism, are already halfway to winning the debate because they've forced everybody to use their terms. One more question. Uh, yes. Um, anyway, thanks for your contribution. I think this is really important. Um, Diane Perlman, I'm a political psychologist. Um, this was sort of um, alluded to, but well, I have a hypothesis that the jihadist or the human rights, view, that a lot of the violence that we're talking about is a function of the hegemonic, of asymmetrical power dynamics, and that if there were a concert of power, that that would happen much less. And saying the concert, like let's say every country has their song to sing. Right. So if they were supported in doing that, then even like the internal less, I'm not saying yeah. well, that, that's, zero, that's, a good, that's a good question. In the case yeah. of Al-Qaeda, I'd have to disagree for two reasons. Uh, the first is in the concert of power system that, that I envision, uh, no Arab country would participate as one of the great powers simply because uh, no Arab country is a sufficient military uh, industrial power at this point, maybe in a hundred years. Uh, so to, to the extent that humil there might still be a feeling of humiliation. Under an invasion of, I mean, in, in Muslim, in the bases in Muslim right. countries, is that where? Right. Uh, uh, you know, it's true that we may have uh, inadvertently added to the ranks of the jihadists you know, uh, by uh, uh, invading Iraq and, and giving them another cause. But let's remember, if you look at what uh, uh, Osama bin Laden says and, and what uh, al-Zawahiri say, this is primarily about toppling the governments in the Muslim world itself. We're only collateral damage from their point of view. They did not, they, this is not a war against us in which Egypt and Saudi Arabia and, and Pakistan happen to be involved. This is a war against the regimes of Saudi Arabia and Egypt in particular. Uh, and and they, they're going after us because we're supporting their enemies, right? And, and the whole point of attacking the Europeans and attacking the Americans is to put pressure on their populations to tell the American and European governments 
to uh, cut off support for Saudi Arabia in Egypt. Now, this is a council of desperation for, for them. I mean, they're, they're revolutionaries. They're domestic revolutionaries. They want to overthrow the, the, the governments of their own countries. They, they've tried since the 70s, and they failed because they don't have that much support in their own societies. I'm not an expert on it, but this seems to be what the experts say. So they came up with this desperate, self-serving rationalization that the real reason we can't overthrow Saudi Arabia is not because uh, we're not popular, and they think, and the, most of the population thinks we're dangerous lunatics and doesn't want us anywhere near power. It's because uh, of American military and, and CIA support and, and uh, you know, NATO support and all of that. So if we cut off the American and European support by inflicting enough pain on the American and, and European voters that they tell their, their governors to, their leaders to get out of the Middle East. At that point, without European and American support, you know, uh, we, can, we can topple the Saudi monarchy and, and uh, 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 you know, the Egyptian uh, uh, junta. Uh, this is, seems extremely unlikely. You know, if, if, in fact, the jihadists are becoming less and less popular in, in Muslim societies because of the sheer slaughter and havoc they, they evoke. But I, I do view this as primarily an intra-Arab, uh, uh, not all of them are Arabs, but, but this is really a, an intra-Arab civil war uh, in which we happen to uh, uh, unfortunately be involved, and we have to be, because it is in our interests. And, the, and, uh, and if there were a concert of great power, uh, there, on one issue there would be unanimity if you included the Russians, the Chinese, you know, the major European powers, Japanese and Americans, and maybe the Indians, you know, Brazilians too, which is that the, the, the al-Qaeda uh, jihadists must be kept from taking control of any state anywhere. They must be kept out of power. That's not to defend the policy we've been pursuing, but it's just to say that a, the concert of power doesn't mean that you're not going to have c uh, conflicts, national and regional and religious. It's just that you try to keep them from escalating into conflicts among the great powers. Uh, because if, as I said earlier, you know, jihadism is bad enough, but what if one other great power saw it as being in its interest to subsidize it? You know, we would be facing a problem on a vastly greater scale. If you look at the end of the Cold War, a lot of uh, opponents of the Cold War, I was a, a Cold War liberal, as we used to be called, said, well, Americans are mistaking all of these things for having something to do with the Cold War. You know, these ter Carlos the Jackal and terrorism and, and uh, uh, the Bader-Meinhof gang and, and all of these things. We're exaggerating the Soviet element to it, uh, various civil wars in Latin America. Well, guess what? The Soviet Union dissolves. Yeltsin cuts off the money. Uh, the KGB guys come home, kaboom, all sorts of conflicts collapse overnight. It turns out they really were being ramped up. That's not to say there wouldn't be some conflicts there anyway, but at the scale they were, it was this, the fact that they were, and, and that's true uh, of what we did in, in the Afghan war as well, where we were supporting the Mujahideen against the Soviets. So my nightmare is that our relations with Russia and China in particular continue to deteriorate to the point not that we have nuclear war or great naval battles with the Chinese fleet or something, but that we get back into another Cold War where one local conflict after another, including maybe this jihadist conflict in the Muslim world, you know, uh, we're arming and supporting and equipping rival sides. Uh, and that's a very dark world. And the Cold War was a very dark era, even though it didn't come to actual bombs falling on, on America. But millions and millions of people, mostly not so Soviet citizens and U.S. citizens, were slaughtered because of it, because civil wars that would have fizzled out had the superpowers not intervened, and, and that includes us, went on and on and on and on in Indochina, in Afghanistan, you know, in Africa. And regardless of the merits of the local uh, contending factions, if it hadn't been for this American and Soviet money and, and arms flowing in, uh, lots of people will be alive today, you know. So the only th thing worse th th than uh, a world war fought through these proxy wars uh, is, is a conventional world war. But cold wars have to be averted too. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.